I love that about my brother, but we got I can see you ready to jump right in. And we're gonna to get to you. We're gonna to get to you though, brother. No, don't you don't. I written down to my ten questions and handed them out. Oh, you got your 10 questions already. Oh, I, I love it. I love it. Always prepared. No, well, we love our brother's intellectual engagement. But, but you, but, and I'm not going to exclude him in any way, but I know he has his voices raised before. So we'll start off with our dear sister in the front. Um, actually, I wanted to go back to your question on 3D printing. <laughs> I'm sorry, your comment on 3D printing. I, um, I think that there is uh, there is things that are, there are things that are implied in a certain way by uh, the religion of the future about technology, and that's sort of been touched on to some extent. But I also think that uh, there are things in neuroscience and AI that are really difficult for people not to constantly be thinking about in this day and age, especially like being around MIT and places like that and hearing about brain implants and things of that nature and also thinking about things like, uh, I don't know, things that have happened in the past, um, eugenics and, and other things that have happened. And so I'm just trying to sort of connect some of the dots between like that thought and what you were saying about 3D printing and, you know, things about uh, automation and unemployment. And I don't know, it just all seems like this very toxic cocktail of, like, nationalist, um, already nationalism and scapegoating going on that could become something pretty terrifying or is has become something very terrifying. But at the same time, that question about like, technology and what it can do for us with the same power structures that are just amplified, like, I don't know, if you could maybe touch on some of that. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to let it flow for a little bit before we... <laughs> yes. There are two questions that stem from um, the conversations. The first is obviously why is it that we should all not commit mass suicide? <laughs> we are continually experiencing and perpetuating suffering. So from the Eastern and Western viewpoint, what is it that should stop us from ending our lives? Now, is that a personal question? Yes, We love you, we love you, man. <laughs> but you had two questions, I'm just one. No, we're good. Okay, that's okay. Right. Yes. Well, um, I come from Peru. 70 years old, and uh, thanks to this class, I think I have understood my life, practice, what I live. Um, I'm Catholic, as everybody in my country, and I think you have, you in this course have changed at least the way I understand my life, you know, and have provided me uh, with the idea to how I can live the next 20 years, maybe, of my life. My dad went over 100 lucid, my mom 96 lucid. So maybe if I got the genes, I have 20 more years to go in the context of life, it could. And my question, uh, I'm sorry I, I, I wasn't able to take these courses when I graduated the Harvard Law School here. Um, I always wanted to understand what you have said to us. And my question would be, how can I best prepare myself to die only once? <laughs> We've been so involved with technology, you know, this rise of smartphones, the rise of computers, and the portable, yeah. portable technology. And now there's been a pushback 
that people are realizing that it's consuming their lives. It's uh, you're going to push back to living in your life. Um, the companies would want us to believe that the way to fix this is by buying another product and furthering this by you know either getting a dumber phone or a watch or something. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on how can we push back against that? Is there a way to shift that back, uh, or is it too late? and also uh, a search for you know common good it, it, it's like uh, you know the self sells uh, at one at the same time as an agent and, uh, and also a hindrance uh, to, to that quest and uh, in, in, in terms of uh, you know, self-love and, and also selfless uh, love uh, you know which way to go is it self Less love and then uh, self love together, or selfless love uh, that will help us to achieve uh, the good life and uh, the common good that, that we are all looking for. And uh, uh, the idea of agape love has been uh, problematized by Professor Onga in one of his books, The Religion of the Future. Uh, I've heard the idea all this while that uh, agape love is a kind of selfless uh, love, but not ignoring uh, the self itself. Uh, so in that sense, it's like the self is an agent uh, in, in uh, bringing the desire to go while not being a, a, a hindrance to that. Uh, but, but again, bringing the, the idea of the Eastern religions into view, uh, whereby it's like um, uh, one should... Uh, walk towards having a kind of selflessness and, and then um, desirelessness uh, in, in order to bring about the, the common good. So I don't know how all these things add up together uh, because we're still asking the question, how do we achieve uh, you know, the good life and then the common good? I was listening to a lecture a few days ago um, where a priest was citing Pope Francis and he was talking about some of the special qualities of the Pope and how he looks at the world. First, from a standpoint of values. Um, secondly, very outwardly focused. And thirdly, having a strong sense of caring for the earth, for the climate, for our brothers and sisters, and all the creatures on this planet. And I, I, I walked away feeling better, more optimistic uh, about this. And, and I'm wondering, in, in, in your views, how does this kind of vision square with the kinds of things that we've been talking about in each of these lectures on the conduct of life? Uh, professor, um, how do we engage with the idea of catastrophic trauma, uh, especially when you are not cognizant that this could be a trauma? Especially uh, when people are working in social justice movement and those kind of activities that brings into private space, so there is no difference between public and private. How do we embrace pain? Now, we are assuming that many of these questions will be reflected in the papers exam that you are writing. So that you are wrestling with these. You would say some of these points are directed to yourselves in terms of your 15 pages. Is that, is that a fair assumption? I hope it is. So, uh, the title of my paper is If Jesus were an activist in the United States, he would have been beaten, jailed, or killed by them. And um, 
in drawing parallels between the life of Jesus and how he was uh, treated by the nation state um, who coordinated with political and economic beliefs. Um, when I parallel that to activist movements here in the United States, whether uh, they be uh, labor movements, uh, racial justice movements, um, or uh, movements that fight against uh, xenophobia in the form of the Trump era right now, um, one, one constant theme I see between uh, Jesus's life and the life of activists here in the United States is that uh, they are willing to sacrifice themselves, um, and in order, in, in doing that, um, they oftentimes concede their job prospects, um, their <coughs> popularity, and you know their health, and, and in some cases throughout our country's history, uh, their lives. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, know what sort of emphasis. Uh, you three would, would place on uh, the concept of sacrificing oneself for the betterment of society because I, I think that's just so overbearing in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> my, <clears throat> my question is in regards to uh, technology, um, like as been mentioned before. Um, particularly consciousness uh, or self-awareness. Uh, if, for instance, we, we, we want to make like a self-aware machine, like an AI, which is very uh, sentient, you know, conscious as we are, uh, th then my, my question would be is in terms of what, what, whether or not happiness for such, a, for such a being would be the same as the way we envision happiness, whether even happiness will be a thing, whether love will be a thing. Because I think most of our desires, like, the same way that Freud said, you know, they, they're only just uh, a reflection of some psychological thing that's going down, going on, you know. Um, and mostly the way consciousness comes out of like human beings uh, through evolution, through a process of like you know, suffering to some degree. Uh, and the same way that when you suffer more, it, you become more and more conscious, you know. But for such a being, like the, the question of suffering will not be there because it just came to be. Mm -hmm. So whether or not the things that we find particularly important to us, like happiness, whether or not they'll be the same, they'll, they'll even be a need for such a being. Yes. Um, so I was wondering two things. Uh, first thing, what's the role of the arts and especially uh, of creating? Uh, being creation uh, a way to represent reality in a new fashion and through this exercise, uh, having some sense of agency of that vision of tomorrow, what uh, kind of reality you would like to have and what that has to do with the conduct of life. Um, on the other hand, uh, I would like to get a um, reflection and understanding of, of what's the role of love in living, uh, what's, what's a life uh, without love and what can love contribute to um, being in, on earth beyond just uh, being present as a physical body and more uh, being there fully experiencing the magnitude of what it means to, to live. So thank you very much for the amazing course. I learned a lot uh, this past few months. Um, so I'm thinking about the society in the US. I come from Iran. I came as a refugee five years ago as a Baha'i refugee from Iran, and I studied law, not at Harvard Law School, but in an underground university in Iran, because Baha'is are not allowed to go to universities, to official universities in Iran. But then I was pondering on the life in the US and the society here, and something that really bothered me was, like, simple issues like um, universal health care or single payers, like a system that provides health care to everyone. 
And what I'm trying to figure out is why is it hard as a society that we decide on some goals and just achieve that? Why is it hard to convince everyone that, oh, maybe there is a way out? Like, why, why is it hard that, like, even watching different TV stations, it's like different realities, and people are exposed to these different realities, whereas one person can, I was like, these past two weeks, I've been trying to find good arguments against single um, payer health system, healthcare system, and universal health coverage. And it's very hard to find arguments against, against it. And, and the ones that are, are very easily, like, um, one person can easily answer them. And showing it also, because it's like empirical data that works. But still, the majority of the US don't. Um, believe in a universal health care coverage or a single payer health system. So that's been very baffling to me and as a person that's been advocating for years and years, I'm really interested to see what you recommend and why is it this way. But also, like, I love, love this country. I'm becoming the U.S. citizen tomorrow. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> yes. it, it comes from a place of love. It doesn't come from a place of love. Um, I, I will say again that I think it is uh, unfortunate that we're not looking at African civilization. I think on the question of technology, uh, His Emperor Majesty Haile Selassie of Ethiopia wrote extensively around the use of technology and the betterment of mankind. I think that Africa, long before this time, was already concerned with global sustainability. We were living in mud houses and grass. So I do think that there's an opportunity to look into some of these questions that we're asking from an African perspective. My question is, how do we move from lip, lip service to, to tangible stuff? Like for instance, when my brother talks about a, uh, and, and this question comes from there really, the Pope um, um, speaking eloquently I, I personally think that the Pope has an opportunity to tell the Queen to take back all the jewels and the gold and the diamonds back to Africa. He's not doing that. That does not happen. So how do we move from all of this philosophical talk um, to real tangible connection change for people in the in the in the ground? Because we're, we're going to write these amazing papers, right? And um, and they're going to be magnificent. I hope. Most I know. Um, beautiful minds at Harvard. But how do we move those papers and those um, assertions and, 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 and thesis and, and all of that thinking to making it tangible for the people who are not here right now, um, who, will, who might not get here, and who might not be able to know where are these resources and who might give them these resources? I'll tell you why I'm asking that question, because I feel like the, the, the people who control these resources, you train them. Mm. So in some ways, you mm. have the ability to access yes. our conscience. <laughs> and in some ways, you have the ability to turn that conscience to make us sit in a place where I don't want with my water bottle because of that kind of training. So how do I then get out of this place where I'm, I am being trained in some ways to hog my resources, not to hog? Hey, now, beautiful brothers, brother with a wonderful beard. You come around. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> raise your voice so we can all hear it. Right? It's perpetuated the 3D printing. And now I'm just going to add one more thing. This gentleman here has the point that I've been struggling with for the last five years in this kind of metaphysical environment. And the answer is what motivates people is profit, is money. Old fancy words in philosophy, you know, you can buy the book, read it, very interesting, very entertaining. But the bottom line, if you want to change somebody's direction, you got to pay them. Now that's my challenge. Mm. Mm. I disagree. Mm. Now we got some disagreement, but there's some hands. Yeah, the, something that I've been thinking about that's similar to Brother Bertano over here is, especially when we look at like folks like Schopenhauer or even the great world renunciating folks from the East. Um, I'm curious like how these this sort of transcendental existential depictions of suffering and you know pessimism that start to become divorced from the con their content. So you have like 
people talking about these human things, but not really talking about the specific things that maybe even give rise to the question. And, but how do we appraise what they have to say in light of um, contextual situations, and how do we make sense of, are we ignoring um, certain people's agency and accountability by like painting with a broad stroke that like all the suffering in the world is coming from people's mm. wills, getting tangled with each other, um, and how can we look at what they're saying and make it more applicable to um, specific situations, and make it less just like a theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the same line, are there things you, the three of you, try to do every day or every mm. week or every year that help you stay aligned with values or with the suspicion of the good life? Mm -hmm. or more concretely, for yourself, whether it's on a weekly or monthly basis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to say, like, the people in this room, obviously, are, like, committed to the goals of this course, and, as you said, Professor, for breaking our, radically breaking our assumptions in, of the world, I'm going to let, like, good, good-hearted people in this room. The only issue is, what about those people that don't want to do that, mm -hmm. you know? And the history of the world is, you know, the subjugation of people by other people, and it's lovely, Professor, I'm going to go out there with the idea of love to others but I think <coughs> you were right to mention vulnerability because that leaves us vulnerable to those people that only want to subjugate other people and will therefore not break their assumptions about the world even if they know them to be untrue will hold firm to their own first order moral projects to gain power over others Another note on the point of uh, practical usage of that both these people brought up. If we if we want to build followings around our revolutionary projects, but we also want to avoid patterns, and people tend to fall into patterns, how do we build followings that avoid patterns? How do we build followings that people can people can be a part of, be engaged with, be excited by, but not then fall into their usual way of just doing what I say is like the right thing to do. <laughs> uh, I've been struggling with uh, um, finding some of the philosophical views and, and some of the personal perspectives of a lot of people um, <coughs> that I find very pessimistic about the way that, about the path in which humanity is going. And um, I've just been wondering if it is that uh, we're really worse off now than we were 50, 100, 200 years ago. Um, if, if humanity is really going into a place of self-hatred and destruction. Or if it's just that we're barely learning to understand a lot of new uh, problems that have just been uh, arising or shown light on and that we are just trying to figure out the, the path to solve them. So I guess my question to all this is are we really doing that bad? Are we really going in, in the wrong direction? Or are we just learning to create new paths? Right? I, guess, I mean, I guess just in response to that, like, who, who is this we? Yeah. And then, so for me, this class has been amazing, but until we're willing to radically rethink how we're going to live in the Western world, this whole conduct of life is really just about the Western world, right? Because, like, if we're going to only take into content, you know, we have these two options, as it feels like, almost. To, to try to live this altruistic life or to live this selfish life. But just living this altruistic life but consuming the way we consume and, and using these things the way we use them, how, how can we talk about any global change? Like, <coughs> like what are we even talking about? That's my question. <laughs> I saw two hands go up right away when he raised that question. <laughs> <laughs> what are we really talking about? <laughs> <laughs> two dear sisters, go right ahead. So I, I went along those lines as well. Um, the idea if we're going <coughs> to take a, to sort of build a, fundamental philosophy of the rest of the foundation. Can we do that on the basis of four fundamental flaws? I wonder if we can, if, if, is it possible to build an understanding of human flourishing on 
flaws. And, and I think for me, I think very much the same way. Um, but I've been thinking along the lines of what is our nature that will allow us to flourish? So what can we cultivate um, inside ourselves in order to flourish? And for me, I've been thinking a lot about our linguistic nature and how the you and the I tie us together and how that could be fundamentally, that's what makes us human. Um, and that's what draws us together, right? You can't really have a you without an I and I um, without a you, and that can be sort of the foundation of our, of our love um, and our belonging. The idea of belittlement, I wonder, and shame is very much tied to our need for the other. Um, and that um, when we don't have the other, because the other is so fundamental to us and to our being that we're very easily shamed when we don't have the recognition, the acknowledgement of the other. And on the other hand, when we do have that recognition, when we are acknowledged, when we are working in community, we flourish. I mean, I see that. And for those that answer Brother's question over here about what to do practically, I would say work in practice. Take this deep into practice, um, these ideas that we have. Take them not to corporate law, but take them you know, into, the, into the courtroom in, as a public defender, if you're at the law school, and work with those who are suffering um, and who are at the margins, right? But in terms of going back to a fundamental idea of what is our fundamental nature and thinking about it in relation of what do we need to flourish, not what are our flaws, but what allows us to flourish. And then we can start thinking about our path dependence. Is we, why fight against our path dependence? Is there a way, just hypothetically, to, um, to think about cultivating the path dependence in some way that leads to a deeper relationality, to a love, to the things that make us flourish. So I just, I just throw that, that question out around cultivating from, a, from thinking about our fundamental nature in a way that's, that is not about a flaw, but it's about something that leads to deep flourishing. And I think there are many models um, in society, the church, when it works properly, being one where we see uh, a deep, effective, flourishing, and something that allows people to shift out of their need for power. When you're flourishing, when you feel loved, when you feel recognized, and I know this seems simplistic, that craving, that deep insatiability loosens a little because you're getting something. So can we start building a sociocultural formation based on that? There's a hand in the back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I just have been thinking a lot about the structures and methodologies we use in the course to talk about these subjects. Um, so I think a lot of what we're talking about and writing about against meta-ethics is this idea of a linear discourse and the idea of a rational self. But I feel like to an extent, we've kind of taken on a linear discourse of our own making and our, the methodologies of the course itself. Um, so I'm thinking about kind of the patterns of disciplines that maybe we've fallen into um, and maybe conducts of lives and a project of a conduct for life would kind of demand a radical reevaluation of the methodologies we're using to discuss it in itself. Given all the philosophical courses on the conduct of life, I was, I was wondering what in your in the your imagination, what MLK's um, notion of uh, dangerous unselfishness looks like could look like today, since we're talking about solving problems and going beyond the academy and being more on the ground. And this is a notion that's been kind of haunting me these past few weeks, because I see dangerous selfishness, but I don't, I don't know what dangerous unselfishness looks like. Mm. <laughs> so uh, when I listen to this question, so I, and throughout our course, um, I have this question in mind, what, what is it for? It, are we talking about the perfection of the self or the perfection of society? What is our purpose? So I guess both, right? And we need the first not to have the second. But we should keep those two things in a relation with each other when we uh, started this material, I guess. And for this purpose, I, I would like to see in the future um, few assignment, assignments on Greek philosophy. I guess our Greek philosophy always underlines our discussion, but um, it's interesting to see what those people thought 
about this relation between the mm. self and society. They illuminate the whole thing, I guess. And to um, to consider them in and of themselves. I mean, what is the primary source of what Aristotle said, what Plato said about those things. I'm Greek, so I'm, I feel obliged to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, uh, I feel like this is what we miss in our class, and what everybody should have the opportunity. Maybe some people did in college, but said they have, have the opportunity to actually read those things themselves. They may change their lives. We were blessed to have such a uh, high quality teaching fellow who actually assigned some of the Greeks. Is that right, my dear friend? Absolutely right, but then my argument would be that if only we read Plato more carefully, mm -hmm. to our discouragement, would really find that we have very little to add. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> but more on that later. <laughs> You're not saying that Plato exhausted the possibility of insight and wisdom thereafter. <laughs> that he has not done, but I think up until his day were insufficiently oriented into how rich, when it comes to methodology and when it comes to coming up with the typology of ontological, epistemic, and all other sorts of glitches, what's there. So we, I strongly feel that with Plato, we're only beginning mm -hmm. to open the door of, uh, just to see what he has mm -hmm. available for us. Uh, Being out for the North White, as it wasn't for the footnotes to play that would make sense. But the footnotes can be rich. Very, very, very rich. Uh, very rich. Well, Pascal and the Chickens are another, but also non Western voices that are in conversation implicitly with Plato. But there's no doubt that the Greeks are indispensable. The question is that in the end, I don't know any tradition that's not in some way in that, even the Greeks. Uh -huh. It's crucial as rich as they are. But let's get any other voices before we... Uh, uh, so, well, one thing I want to say about the <coughs> question of the voices is that I'm really I'm, the important thing is we want you to be able to voice what you are wrestling with, both in your paper but also in your life. And it, 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 in the academy, we keep talking about beyond the academy, beyond the academy. The academy is a fundamental part of the world. It's never the academy versus the world. The academy has the same problems of domination, same problems of prejudice, same problems of blind spots. Why? Because it's inhabited by human beings, just like on the rock, and even through the neighborhood. So it's not a matter of the world's on one side, the academy's on the other, and the academy is a question of trying to do something on the ground. We on the ground right now in this class at Harvard, uh -huh. right? Brother just had encounter with the police. Was that on the ground enough? <laughs> we have concrete realities. We got wounds. We got bruises. As Harvard students, as Harvard staff, as Harvard professors. It's not Harvard versus the world, Academy versus the world. <coughs> no, not at all. The Academy is a slice of the world. We got two brothers graduating, marched, marched with dignity, made it 12. So they can testify. The last three years have been on the ground, haven't they? Hard work, sacrifice, up, down, round, and round. Now, granted, there's privilege at Harvard. Whoa, that's something else, because there's privileged slices of the world. And there's other slices of the world that are less privileged. Persons behind brothers and sisters in the Middle, Middle East dealing with persecution. Other people dealing with persecution. That's part of the world. And the privileged folk there, they're part of the world too. So th this notion of academy versus the world, I think, needs to be problematized. When we talk about conduct of life, this has to do in part with your own life in relation to the network communities and matrices that you choose to be a part of. If you're an artist and not on the ground, I'm not holding my breath for your art. <laughs> it's way up here. I mean, that's part of the problem of artists being the academy. You confuse the universe with the universe. University. <laughs> but the university, part of the universe. So I, so I have nothing wrong with artists who are in the academy, who understand the academy and the non-academy as still part of the whole world. Poet, novelist, and all. We've got some wonderful artists in this room, I know. So George George and so forth and so on, dealing with them like themselves and so forth and so on. Crucial stuff. But I think that's a crucial starting point. 
Because in the end, we accented the existential at the very beginning. And what is the existential? Your lives. What choices you will make. What commitments you will make. When we talk about Martin King, dangerous unselfishness, all he was talking about is how does he leave a committed life behind? So in addition to Socrates, the unexamined life, he said, no, the unexamined life is not enough. You got to leave a committed life. You can examine your life all you want and still remain a spectator. You can interrogate yourself all you want and still remain simply a spectator. The committed life is something else. Now, we started this course saying what? Not to choose is to choose. Even when you choose suicide. Not you personally, but somebody else. <laughs> That's a choice. Maybe you put too much stress on life. Commit suicide. You're in time and space. What did you expect? Disneyland? You didn't get it? You want to kill yourself? Grow up. Mm. Life's not like that. You gotta learn how to struggle. Learn how to cope. Learn how to endure. Learn how to persevere. That's in part of the conduct of life is in its very concrete existential sense. But it's also tied to the social. Absolutely. We made that point, right? The self and the, and the social go hand in hand. But too many people want to reduce the self and only talk about the social. Hmm? Or vice versa. Or exactly. And in America, it's more likely the self, 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 self. Because society is just a place where I become successful and achieve the American dream. As if there's no structures of domination. As if there's no institutional practice that demonizes and devalue and dishonor and so on. So it's very different. When we're trying to get a broad sense, but not just in America, not just in Europe, not just in Asia. We're looking for the global, but we did not have, you know, the strong African voices to try to accent all the other dimensions. We didn't have indigenous people's voices as well. We, we acknowledge that quite explicitly. Very much so. But the, uh, but I mean, your, your comments have been, did you want to say anything about comments? Sure, oh, please go ahead. I'll say a few very quick words, but let me also say, all of you feel free to respond to these questions. Yeah, Don't feel that you must ask questions and we respond. I mean, feel free to engage as well. So, with that vein, I'll only touch on a few. Key themes, and let me begin with suicide. Um, no, I disagree with the question. And, and picking up on some of the themes in both Buddhist and Chinese traditions, I would say um, note as a fact that despite the way we perceive the world, act in the world, understand the world, everything is absolutely interconnected. When there is, and I mean, it's empirical fact, horrific suffering in the world, the truth is we are in part responsible. We have both created that suffering, we are actively in the ways we are living our lives, allowing that suffering to continue. And suicide, in the sense of, oh, I'm suffering, I want to escape, that escape, number one, is an incredibly selfish act to take. And number two, will not actually help anything because, in fact, by definition, that is going to create horrible suffering from those around you. Mm -hmm. And picking up again on the themes worked out in very different ways in Buddhist and Confucian traditions, but they would very much agree in the ultimate implication, um, it doesn't work anyway <laughs> because all the suffering we're creating doesn't end, I personally believe, mm -hmm. because it continues. Mm -hmm. Either, in one sense, because the reincarnation, because the aggregates of suffering I've created will be reincarnated, or in another sense, the patterns I've created will just go on through generations. But however one wants to frame it, the fact is we are part and parcel of creating horrible suffering around us, and simply trying to escape that will simply continue that suffering, in fact, make it much worse. So put that way, we must take responsibility for what we are doing in creating the suffering around us and helping it to continue. And therefore, if one takes that seriously, one has absolutely no other possible way of living, unless one wants to continue the, the self is suffering that, that, that we're doing, other than devoting one's life to trying to change that. And that touches on so many of the questions. So I'll simply speak very briefly. Um, what 
that is going to mean in any given context is going to be absolutely undecidable. Um, I very much agree if it's spoken of simply in the abstract, oh, you know, life is suffering, that will accomplish nothing. I fully agree. It's all about concretely, from a very local level, how are little things I'm doing in the world, from the way I, yes, live my life and the kind of power structures that allow that life to continue to the ways I speak in terms of voices of different people, to the very structures of power that my way of life continues at every level from the seemingly very personal to the overtly extremely social, I am part and parcel of creating a world of suffering. And therefore, to touch on a theme that just popped up constantly, and rightly so, what that will mean in terms of devoting my life to trying to change this world is going to mean all of that. <laughs> it's going to be going through all of these different levels and constantly trying to alter the seemingly personal and the, the clearly social and those that implication in between as a life project. And again, touching on one of the themes of the Buddhist tradition in particular, um, it is very unlikely in this one life that you will see that you succeed somewhat and you impact the world somewhat, sometimes extremely dramatically, and that will help others and yet others and others. And what you're aiming for, and I'll shift immediately into the Confucian tradition, or you, you really can create, at both the local level and the grander level, pockets of human flourishing that will allow the next generations to flourish as well. And that's what you're devoting your life to. This is an endless process, an endless process that we know by moment, trying to be both self-conscious of what we are doing to create the suffering and what we can do to alter that and to begin to create a better world. And again, the fact that is undecided as to what that will mean, when we will constantly be failing, but part of your commitment is trying to learn from those failures and see what things I thought I was doing to create a better world were in fact making it much worse. And then how do I go from that and try to change that and help that and help those around me and struggle with those around me and learn from them and their failures and hope their successes too. That's a life. It's an extraordinarily powerful vision of what it really life entails. Um, not an easy life, but an unbelievably important one. And again, to touch on one final theme, um, a joyous one. Right? And, the, the, and this is one thing you see in so many ways in both the Buddhist and Confucian traditions. And that term comes up constantly. The joy that comes out of that constant work. It sounds like what a horrible world of more suffering that this is what I commit my life to. Actually, no, it's sort of the opposite because you begin to really create a better world and out of that comes intense joy. Not for me personally, but I mean intense joy out of those relations that you begin to actively be part of creating. So, wonderful questions. I'm happy to say we don't have answers, but the exciting side of that very point is it's that act of trying to pose these unanswerable questions, but then devoting one's life in practice to trying to solve them in terms of what that would mean moment by moment. That is an extraordinary vision for what we should be doing. So thank you. So I think uh, of Michael Cornell, uh, uh, what I could do, just by way of uh, contributing to this conversation, <coughs> is uh, to answer these questions not by providing answers, but simply by uh, reminding you of some of the concerns and attitudes of, uh, that have marked the arguments of the Course. Because indirectly, at least, they're responsive to many of your questions. So the first thing to say is, that we can't proceed on the assumption that we know what to do and that our problems are problems of implementation, problems resulting from the, the distance between our ideas about what to do and the organization of the world, uh, as if it were simply a matter of implementation. Uh, the starting point of the course is the the claim, the assumption, that we don't know what to do, and that we're confused, and that we're confused in our basic ideas uh, about the organization of society, and very especially <coughs> with respect to the themes of this course, the conduct of life. Uh, and uh, we have to choose, 
theme that we've kept re returning to. We have to choose. We never have conclusive arguments for the direction to which we commit ourselves. But we do have grounds, complete grounds, in, in conclusive grounds. And there's an enormous distance between thinking that we have no grounds and believing that we can aspire to these incomplete and inconclusive grounds, this small area of light. Now, then comes the second question of, posed by, by one of the very first provocations today. What leads us to live, to want to live? What is the antidote to suicide? Now, uh, there have been two <coughs> main families of conceptions of, of happiness or of the good. One is the minimalist conception, that happiness is simply privation of suffering. And it seems that that view, or that family of views, could never be an adequate response to your question. Because suffering is perpetual, and we can mitigate it, but we cannot stop it. Uh, and that then leads us to the other family of views, that the only adequate antidote uh, to the temptation to kill ourselves is some experience of being that once we have it, we find irresistible. And that then leads to this notion that the experience of being is not a single thing, it's not univocal, but that it's capable of growing, of being magnified, <coughs> uh, of becoming bigger, and becoming bigger in a way that is not isolating, but that is shared. And that it is then, on that family of views, it's that bigness, that then is the sole adequate antidote to suicide. And it's a different view of happiness. So it's a view of happiness that is compatible with contradiction, with disharmony, with incompleteness, and therefore with suffering, uh, which, which is perennial. Now, then comes the third set of ideas and, and, and attitudes, which is that in, in dealing with these problems, uh, a crucial element is our conception of who we are. So if we are to overcome this confusion and to have an orientation, we must begin to develop a view of our identity, of our vocation. And there are many ways in which such a view can be developed, but your own questions today, the questions about technology, suggest that one of the many ways to develop a view of who we are is to, is to say in what respect we are not machines or not like machines. So uh, the machine is the embodiment of uh, a formula or an algorithm. Uh, it's what we've learned how to repeat. It's what the machine is. And then we could say, well, there's maybe a second step in the development of technology beyond these algorithmic or formulaic machines, which are what you could call problem-solving machines. They resolve practical problems, like uh, how to drive a car without a human driver, or even more simple things, how to open a doorknob. And they may not be reducible to a formula or an algorithm, but they do exclude something still, this second level of technology, that has to do with our identity. And what they exclude is the imagination. So we have this characteristic that we are capable of experiencing things and discovering things that are not countenanced by our established methods and presuppositions. We discover and then retrospectively we develop the methods and assumptions that make sense of what we have discovered. So that's just one aspect of a more general feature of our humanity, which in the arguments of this course I've called our transcendence. 
uh, were shaped by context, by a particular social and cultural world, but there's always more in us than there is in that world. We have a capacity of access, a surface, and therefore a capacity to surprise not just others, but ourselves. Uh, and uh, that capacity can be developed. Uh, and it's what we might think of as godlike. And then we arrive at this idea that we become more human by becoming more godlike. We develop this attribute that is the, it, what distinguishes us from the machines. Uh, now then comes a, a, a fourth set of ideas. There are these, what I called in the very first day of class, these irreparable flaws in the human condition. Our mortality, our groundlessness, our insatiability. Everything that surrounds us is finite, is limited. But it's as if the limited never satisfies us. So everything in our existence points beyond, points beyond itself. And that's part of this attribute of, of transcendence. Uh, but, and, but we'll die anyway. And we don't have a definitive framework for our existence. And so what should our attitude be to these irreparable flaws in the human being? Should we search for some way to deny them? Or should we recognize them? So the history of religion and of philosophy is filled with these feel-good stories that want to tell us that there really aren't these irreparable flaws. And uh, a fundamental decision is about whether we should dispense with these feel-good stories and develop our conception of our humanity and our view of the organization of society and of the conduct of life without relying on them. It comes then a, a what is it now, a fourth set of concerns uh, about the organization of society, of politics, that yeah. many here have mentioned. Uh, so, you know, the last great moment of institutional refoundation uh, in the rich democracies of the North Atlantic world was the social democratic settlement of the mid 20th century. And its counterpart in the United States was the New Deal. And it, it was characterized by a retreat from the attempt to reshape and reimagine the organization of politics and the production. And instead, an attempt to make the best of the existing world, to humanize it through regulation, through redistribution, through counter cyclical management of the economy. Now we confront a series of structural problems in the lives of these societies that seem incapable of being resolved without reopening the terms of that compromise. That is, they require structural innovation, precisely what was abandoned in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, but that leads to a different view of the project of transformation, of the progressive idea, the revolutionary idea. It's not just about humanizing society. It's about divinizing humanity. It's about becoming bigger. And the struggle against inequality on that view is subsidiary to this larger objective. We develop our powers, we become bigger, we affirm this attribute of transcendence by reorganizing both the economy and the state, the market regime and democratic politics. Uh, but then we have a problem, and the problem is that this transformation happens only in historical time, not on the scale of our lifetimes. And so it's not an adequate solution to our question about the conduct of life. So we have to develop a, a view of the conduct of life 
on the scale of a human lifetime in biographical rather than historical time. And that has been the main subject of this course. So many of the comments that were just made in the, in the first half of the class seem to start from the premise that there's some kind of contrast between selfishness and altruism. And the objective is to develop an altruistic view, a selfless view, and to act in its name. Now, I don't agree with that. And uh, I started the very first class by denouncing the uh, point of departure of the universalizing altruism of moral philosophers, the position shared in common by the three schools of meta-ethics. We have a problem of connection to the others. We can't be solved. We can't be saved by ourselves individually through connection. But the character of connection uh, depends on something else, which is how big we are or how small we are. And so this is this issue of greatness, how much we've ceased to be like machines and we've developed our capacity of transcendence. We become stronger and then we can be more magnanimous. So it's not just about how we connect with the others or contain our selfishness. It's about uh, on what basis of bigness or smallness do we establish these connections? And so it's, it's about the relation of greatness to love. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a fundamental theme. And, and, and then it seems then, this is another point of departure, of course, that the models that we have available to us in our culture, in our civilization of how we live, and in, this, and in particular, the two most tangible and influential models, which are Christian charity <coughs> and romantic adventurism, seem insufficient uh, against the background of these concerns and ideas. So that we have to develop a program. Now, finally, let me say, let me again return to, to a claim I made in the very first class that at least helps explain uh, my own interventions here. So my view is that we live in a counter-revolutionary interlude in a long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. A revolutionary period that has extended for the last two or three hundred years. And a point of departure for my interventions and our arguments is the, my refusal to accept the attitudes and assumptions that are characteristic of this counter-revolutionary interlude. So there is a revolutionary project. It has two sides. The political side is carried by the doctrines of democracy, liberalism, and socialism. Uh, and the personalist side, the moral side, is carried above all by the worldwide popular romantic culture, as in popular music or the soap operas. And it has a message. The message is that we're not as small as we seem to be. And the message resonates in every Brazilian slum, in every Indian village, this message is carried throughout the world. So this is the revolutionary project. And it has enemies. So it's not, uh, it, it, it's not as if it has obvious authority. There are, there are arguments in its favor, but it is in a struggle. And it has been, in a sense, the dominant agenda uh, the strongest agenda in the world, because all the other agendas in the world respond to it. But it's paradoxically at the same time now, 
in this counter-revolutionary interlude weak. The reason why it's weak is that its adepts no longer know what its next step should be. And if we don't know what the next steps of the project are, the project weakens. This is the problem. It's a problem on the political side and on the moral side. So for this revolution to continue in the next phase of the life of humanity, and for it to be susceptible to translation, we have an idea about how we should live our lives. We have to know what its next step should be. We have to reinvent it. Because if we don't reinvent it, it dies. So paradoxically, we have to let go of it to make it live. And this is always the paradox in, in, in human life. We have to renounce uh, in order to recover. Uh, and this, then, is the whole uh, inspiration of, of the arguments of the Course. So I think that's really very different from the idea, the assumption that we know what to do, uh, and it's some kind of altruism or social solidarity. Unfortunately, the world is very unjust, and we're very selfish, and so forth. No, it's not like that at all on this view. It's, it's a different set of problems requiring the development of ideas that we don't yet have. So I raise this question, though, what the sources of the counter-revolution are. Mm -hmm. And I raise this question about why it is that the fundamental issues of death and life tend to be pushed to the margins as opposed to just money, fun, and instant gratification and ephemeral pleasures. Because when you take, for example, how much land does a man need? A great story by Tolstoy. Or the death of the village. Connected to not just suicide. Because see, the problem with suicide is it only acts in one particular moment. You can live a whole life in which you've been killing yourself week by week by week. Which you live a life of self-destruction that in retrospect, recognizing you never really lived. Like Ivan at the end. That's a deeper question than just suicide. That's a deeper question than suicide. Then there's Kafka's question, which is the inability to die. Like Prometheus, you're denied the very escape from your pain. Mm -hmm. But that's Kafka's zone. We want to go there right now. But the point is, <laughs> the point is that when we look at what are the sources of the counter-revolution that this brother I'm, I'm just talking about, it has something to do with the intense commodification of a world that shapes our attention to things that no longer, things that don't matter as much as what is fundamental of life and death, and especially with Brother Michael talking about joy. Now, I want to defend the feel-good. See, Brother Unger's hard on the feel-good. I think we have a right to feel good. Because we have a right to joy. That's different than a right to pleasure. And pleasure is, I'm not a Puritan about those things, but that's not primary. We have a right to joy. The problem, the problem with Ivan was he felt good about the wrong things. He felt good about professional work with mobility. He felt good about being included within a certain network of his friends. He felt good about certain approval. He felt good about fitting in. But when it came to his retrospective reflection, that owl of Minerva that spreads his wings upon the falling of the dust that Hegel talked about, Using wisdom to look back at your life. He sees, lo and behold, I never really lived. I was the living dead. Now see, that relates to all of us on the ground, my dear brother. My South African brother, hitting on the ground. I'm with you too. Absolutely. But in our own lives, that is as concrete as it gets. To recognize the degree to which we wasted our potential. We didn't use our gifts because of the lure of the money and status and image and spectacle. And somehow your life is a relative failure because the idols of the world so thoroughly seduced you that you can no longer come to terms with what your calling was. Mm -hmm. See, what's the stick about Jesus and Martin King and Fanny Lou Hammond, Rabbi Heschel and Dorothy? They were, they were true to their calling. And of course, if you're true in your callings, in any moment of the world, crucifixion is a high possibility. So, but character assassination, literal assassination. So I would want to argue that there are conditions under which the feeling good, we ask ourselves, 
We feel good about reading. We feel good about writing. We feel good about trying to be a force for good, but it's not the feel good that Earl Unger was talking about in terms of the, the denial, denial of yeah. death and so forth and so on. So, well, so we got so, to attenuate so, that claim of feeling good, but we don't want to monkey the alternative. You know, so, so the, so the, the perversions that you referred to yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, all, could all be described <laughs> as, as acts of false transcendence, right? They're, they're forms of idolatry. Yes, in which yes. Something that is finite right. and is treated as if it were not finite. And in this way, we, we come to deny our or low quality finite or the high quality our finite. Vocation. We don't have to go infinite right away. But then but then there's there's a question of moral psychology, which is mm. which is relates to this matter of the, what I call the field of factor, mm -hmm. which is what role does the denial of these irreparable flaws in the human condition play in our turn to these uh, acts of false transcendence. In other words, to, to, to turn it around, to what extent is the recognition of these irreparable flaws in the human <coughs> uh, uh, useful to our avoidance of these forms of idolatry and false transcendence? They wake us up from our slumber and turn us to this other conception of, of, of life. Yes, so, yes. And this is a very important feature because uh, it's a different conception. It leads to a different conception of, of happiness, Absolutely. of fullness of being, Absolutely. and of the antidote to suicide. Absolutely. And the fundamental role of the art. Because the fundamental role of the artist is precisely to convince us that as human beings with clay feet in space and time, that any death dodging and death denying cannot but lead to superficiality in its religious forms or in its secular form. This is why the artists are constitutive. It's no accident that in a highly commodified society, Art is always pushed to the margins and viewed as some kind of isolated space. It's no accident that Kant gets to the art after epistemology and after ethics. It should have been the exact opposite. Should have started with the arts. Because this whole course, the conduct of life, is trying to understand what is the artistry of living? What is the artistry of being in the world in such a way that you can deal with catastrophe, deal with death and dread and disappointment and disease, all of them on their ways to our house. No one escapes in space and time without them forcing us to have an intimate relation with them. Catastrophe, death, dread, and so forth. But no, in our society, art is way on the periphery. We get to it finally at the end, maybe of the day or the week maybe in some museum, maybe in some highly mediated radio or TV and so forth and so on, so that the very notion of the, de the, 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 of, of, of the devaluing of arts as if it's some element rather than some vital dimension of what it is to be human says much about these issues of the four or yeah. three especially. Now, now, for now, many of these comments mm -hmm. that have been made here have, have focused directly or indirectly on the relation between the transformation of society right. and right. self-transformation. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem there to which I think we, we have not done justice uh, in, our, in our arguments in the court. So let's say that there are two contrasting perversions. One, one perversion is to treat ourselves, our own lives, as simply instruments for the ascent of humanity. So there's some altruistic, self-denying collective project, mm -hmm. which by its very nature advances only in historical time, beyond the scale of our lifetimes. And then we selflessly uh, give ourselves to that project. And we treat our own lives as just a means to the promotion of that collective end. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that risk being dehumanizing. Because then we, we are estranged from ourselves. We view our own lives as instrumental. Mm -hmm. So that's one perversion. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there, there's an opposite perversion in our understanding of the relation between self-transformation and the transformation of society, which is we're fundamentally interested in our self-transformation. And we treat our political engagements as just a pretext or a means for this self-transformation. So it's a kind of romantic adventure in which there's this problem of the re revivification of the self. And through our struggles, we then uh, find in politics an excuse or a means to engage in this experience of self-liberation. And that it also is a, is a perversion. So then the, it seems that the solution is defined in some space uh, delimited by the rejection of those two positions, huh? in, which, in, which we, in which we have to believe, in which we have to hope that there is some overlap and some affinity between our political stake in the transformation of society and our moral stake in the transformation of ourselves. So in society, there's a structure. The development, the advancement of our interests and ideals always depends on some transformation of this structure, on institutional innovation, which is, in, re in historical reality, almost always fragmentary. It's not these big systemic substitutions as described by Karl Marx and his followers. Uh, but we have a similar problem in our lives, which is this problem that I've called mummification. We, we, a carapace of routine and compromise begins to form around us, and then we begin to die these many small deaths. And our interest is to die only once, to maintain and to develop the supreme good of life until we die all at once. Uh, and so then it seems that the rebellion against structure is useful in making us effective agents in the transformation of society. Uh, but the transformation of society is not just a pretext to change ourselves. There's this, this, structural, this structural similarity between the political problem and the moral problem. And they overlap and reinforce each other. That's what we could hope for. But we actually don't have that doctrine. So that's an example of a set of ideas that would go beyond those two tangible images of Christian charity or romantic adventurism. And we need that. So we need, we need ins institutional projects that go beyond institutionally conservative social democracy. And we need moral ideas that go beyond Christian charity and romantic adventures. And to my mind, that, that has been the agenda of the course. Uh, and uh, it's, it, 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 it highlights the the point with which I began in my remarks just now, which is our, our confusion. Uh, so the, the, just as our spiritual idea should not deny the irreparable flaws in the human condition, mm -hmm. our attempts to think through these problems should begin in the recognition of our confusion. And not on, on the false assumption that we know what to do, yeah. But that we're, we are embarrassed or pained by our difficulty in implementing our clear message. The problem is not, is not primarily in the implementation. The problem is in the message itself. That, that, but I think where we find it, you all jump in any time here, that we got clashing metaphors of dying. Because you talk about mummification in terms of the, the small deaths every day, and we want to be able to only have that one death. Our dear sister from Peru talked about. I talk about dying every day in order to be transformed, in order to be reborn. And that's a different resonance because the dying every day accents the activity 
of a cell for an organism that's wrestling day by day with the catastrophic, the misery, the suffering, the pain. Mummification presupposes a self that is being acted upon with a small death, and that one big death that we have is the act activity of a self. Part of the genius of Hebrew scripture and the Christian tradition, not as a model of Christian charity, but it is as a wonderful portrait that Brother Roberto has in his office, the 32nd chapter of Genesis, where, 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 where Jacob is wrestling with the angel of death in the midnight hour and emerges with a warm energy, vision, God wrestler, Israel. New name. That is a conception of life in which you are wrestling day in, day out, learning how to die to be reborn over and over and over and over again. And that strikes me as always centered on a certain kind of cross because it's impossible to be committed to love and justice in any moment in human history and not be subject to persecution, not be subject to being lied on, misunderstood, misconstrued. And that's true anywhere. At Harvard, Roxbury, Harlem, Gaza, Tel Aviv, Tehran, Alice Ababa, Nairobi, anywhere. That's what it is to be human with the kind of organisms that we are. We just happen to be so wonderful and wretched at the same time. And every moment of human history is shot through with this domination, hatred, oppression, envy. And the question becomes, how do you push it back inside of us? Because it's not external, but also in the institution and the structures simultaneously. So in that sense, that's one reason I've been resisting this notion of that small deaths every day didn't have <laughs> big whammy at the end. Uh, uh, versus the but the pre but the premise of your remarks in yes, the, in, yes. the, in the interpretation of those religions and those and those monotheisms right. is this idea of our share of our share in the life of God. This, and this is the idea of the infinity of the, of, the, of the human being. The human being is made in the image of God, according to those religions. And therefore, the, the question of connection to the others, of solidarity, is posed differently in a set of beliefs that affirms this infinity of the human being, or in the language of these religions, our share in the life of God. Yes, yes. So, that, that's that's the crucial connection. We've got common ground, yeah. and that's so, But I think the difference here, though, brother, is this: that when you talk about transcendence and transformation, those <coughs> tropes in your belt and show, transcendence can go either way. It can go evil. <coughs> it can go up non yes. Same is true with transformation. In this counter-revolutionary moment, Mussolini was highly committed to. Transcendence and transformation. He was a romantic. He just went the wrong way to the gangsters and stuff. Jews, working class people across the board. So that <coughs> for my tradition, which is very Pascal and Kierkegaardian, Coltranian, and Aretha Franklin, <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask it as much the underside of course. and the night side of transformation and transcendence as I am the possibilities for the good, yes. the possibility. And that's, that's something that I, I think needs to be just put plainly on the, but you, you accept that too. Totally. And, and you know, we disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we need to agree? <laughs> <laughs> we two different brothers, you know. We agree, we, we agree, don't we, with, with, with the proposition that one of the philosophers we admire, Whitehead, who said that the business of the future is to be dangerous. No, well, we definitely agree this. We definitely. You know, there's a wonderful lesson about William James, the sentiment of rationality, where he's critical of philosophers who are tied to a conception of rationality that's associated with peace and ease and rest. And he says, I don't want peace and ease and rest. I want trouble. I want danger. Very crucial. One of the great essays of the 19th century. In fact, he was so crucial in an essay, he wrote it twice. <laughs> Two versions of it, the sentiment of rationality, but it's a powerful critique 
of so much of the dominant philosophical tradition in the West that want to associate not just peace and ease, but usually it gets translated socially into looking for adjustment and fitting in the status quo. That's the peace you want. And that's the fit you want. That's what we're calling it. And Cornell has been a recurrent theme in the arguments of the course. The idea of happiness as privation of suffering and contradiction yes. has been associated in the history of moral thought with the uh, with the aim to stay out of trouble. And we have all these philosophies that are theorizations of this simple conception. And the opposing view is look for trouble. We need to look for trouble to live, to have self-transformation. And then when we look for trouble, uh, it can be not what we wanted. And it can, it can be evil, it can be destructive, but it is, on this view, the condition of life. Yeah. And, and it, it is, it is the, the equivalent in our moral experience of the disruption of structure in society, of institutional structure, which similarly can then be the beginning of catastrophe and of, and of evil. Right. But yeah. without which, we then become just hostage uh, uh, to these, to, to the past, and we allow the dead to rule over the living. I wouldn't go that far with the dead again. Now, we don't want to talk about tradition versus the present again. I wish that some of the dead were ruling over much of the living. I can tell you that right now. Depends on which dead ones you're talking about. But I'll say this, that when Mr. Franklin wade in the water, God's going to trouble the water. You're going to find power in the water because that in that trouble is a possibility of both transformation of evil as well as the good. Or in Hebrew scripture, where it says God has God's way in the whirlwind and the stormwall. That's Nahum, the minor prophet. It's in the whirlwind and the storm. Garvey says what? When I come back, you're going to find me in the whirlwind. You see, that's the very thing that most professionals fear. They fear the trouble. They fear the whirlwind. They fear the storm. They want to calm down, tranquilize, regulate, professionalize, control, dominate, manage catastrophe. Especially when they're not the victims of it. When they're the victims of it, ooh, yeah, it's a different thing then. Oh, now we're going to fight. We're warriors now all over again. Now there's folk who are actually warriors against your hierarchy that you're on the top of. My dear brother in the back. Yeah, I quick question. Uh, Related to Dr. Angus' remark about we, we don't uh, uh, know what to choose or we don't know what the, the, the choice is. How do we know when we're talking about this that as humans we're also a species of animal that no matter what we do we really don't have any control over the way things end up? In other words, we're not plugged in on a conscious <coughs> level. We do what we know, we do what uh, we learn, but the end result is a combination of individual and group as an animal species. So it wouldn't matter what we do, ultimately, that is uh, that brings about the result. So, so this would be a long argument about determinism well, uh, of different kinds, biological determinism and historical determinism. Mm -hmm. But I'll just say this. Uh, a very important feature of these views has to do with path dependency in the history of society. Not specifically biological determinants, but social and historical determinants. So the extent to which the path, the past determines the future. Now, I want to argue, path dependency is not a constant. Path dependency is a variable. And we can so organize society as to diminish the power of the past over the future. So if, if we create economic and political institutions that facilitate their own revision, their correction in the light of experience, 
uh, we diminish the power of the social path. It doesn't answer your claim of biological determinism, but it does it does go to the question of historical determinism. And this is a crucial feature in our historical in our present historical situation for for a reason that has come up uh, during this semester. So the reason is this that like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we recognize the primacy of structural change. <coughs> so humanization, redistribution, reallocation of resources within an unchanged framework is never enough. Pieces of the framework have to be changed. But unlike the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we can no longer bring ourselves to believe in any definitive institutional blueprint, in an institutional dogma. And therefore, for us, a, a vital attribute of the economic and political arrangement is that they not imprison us and that they, and that they facilitate their own revision, their own correction in the light of experience. Uh, that's a problem without precedent in our experience. That's, uh, it requires a different way of thinking. And uh, it, it, it has analogies in, in our moral experience, once again. How we, how we weaken the power of the past over the future in us, in our moral experience. So rather than theorizing about this, let me just uh, recall a remark that the American philosopher Santayana made about the American philosopher William James. Santayana said the following. Uh, he was so extremely natural that there was no way of telling what his nature was or what came next. So that's what we should all desire for ourselves. I like that though. Are the voices Yes. I don't know if I'm fully convinced that um, the different religion just denying these problems and I don't know if I'm convinced of that. The different religions or, or denying death, you mean? Um yeah, I mean I can't quote you, Professor Ender, uh, clearly, but you said a number of times. Um, no, no, I didn't mean, no, no. I was speaking about the Semitic Manapes. Because remember, here there are different orientations to life in the town. So the, the, the Near Eastern Salvation religions, the Semitic Manapes, and Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, do, 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 in a way, they do deny uh, they, they, these, what I'm calling these irreparable flaws in the human condition. Uh, and they say that there's a solution to them. Now, if we turn to, to Buddhism and the religion of the Vedas in ancient India, uh, those spiritual orientations don't deny those irreparable flaws in the same way or to the same extent. Because they say this, everything changes into everything else. Distinction is superficial. The real is unified being, which is ultimately timeless. That's not a denial of death. That's a statement that death is not what it seems to be. Then we come to Confucianism, for example, which in a way is an anti-metaphysical metaphysic. It says that in a cosmos that's indifferent to us, we open a small world of meaning. But it doesn't deny uh, mortality, or groundlessness, or even insatiability. It has a practical solution to it which is our engagement with the others in a certain way. So it is true that uh, 
these different spiritual orientations in the history of humanity uh, do not deny the irreparable flaws in the human condition to the same extent or in the same way. Now, there's a paradox or a problem in my position with respect to this, which is it should be obvious that uh, of these positions, the one that, that I'm closest to is the one of the Semitic monotheism. That's the idea of transcendence. That's the idea of our infinity. But at the same time, I'm rejecting in those religions the denial of these, of these flaws in the human condition. So what does that mean? So, uh, but that means that your worldview is still under the shadow of the legacy of Jerusalem. It's just that you cannot accept certain conclusions that have been reached by various people who are also in that language. Is that, is that fair? That's right. So that the, that the way I call this revolutionary project right. is intimately related to these religions. Absolutely. But there are two versions of it. There's the, there's the uh, religious version and there's the secular version. Uh, and the question is whether this uh, experience of ours, political and personal, has to be understood or not as being within a larger framework of interactions between God and you. And uh, but you would this is a question. The fact that Kierkegaard doesn't deny death, and Hegel doesn't deny death, and Pascal doesn't deny death, and Barb doesn't deny death. I don't think Augustine denies death. Well, in what sense? Can, it, can one be a Christian and deny eternal life? Well, it depends on what you mean by denial and what you mean by eternal life. Absolutely. I don't think you can be a Christian and be a death-denying mortal. Because Christianity is very much about learning how to die in order to learn how to live. That's what new being is. That's what it's fundamentally about. Now, if you're talking about distinct temporal zones, in terms of immortality and so forth, and that's a different kind of discussion. But, but the, the denial of death is one thing, and the projection <coughs> of possibilities beyond space and time is something else. And you're saying, well, any claim of life beyond space and time is itself a species of the denial of death? If, you, if that's the claim, then I can understand well, no, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the claim of the eternity, the immortality right. of the human being, the soul, is not a metaphor. Uh, it's uh, you know, there's now, right. there's now in the world this attempt to split the difference between believing and not believing, and the practical result of it is the sentimental will to believe, and. The sentimental will to believe in practice always, almost always ends up being a way of dressing up the political and moral pieties of the day. So we don't need religion for that. We need religion to be a store that carries us in a direction in which we didn't expect to go or even want to go. Otherwise, it's superfluous. But why is a storm if so facto, almost a priori, confines this space and time. I mean, William James's argument the will to believe, part of his genius was that it had to do with people who are so fearful of air, they don't want to acknowledge that the evidence is underdetermined such that you don't know what the conditions for the possibility are beyond. You simply just don't know. Yes. That's it. That's all you can say. Right. Well, but that doesn't preclude it. It just says you just don't know. It makes no sense. But it takes us directly to what we were talking about earlier, which is the role of folly. We talked about Sebastian Brent's Ship of Fools and the Dance of Death. We talked about the way in which folly can easily fade into wisdom or fade into a more intense form of ignorance. It can go either way in that regard. And if that's the case, then I think we might have to be a bit more charitable or open-minded about what is the fundamental 
core of Judaism. And I don't think Judaism denies that at all. Which is choose life. In the consciousness of potency, in the consciousness of impotence, in the consciousness of wrestling with evil, in the consciousness of wrestling with good. You're choosing life. <coughs> and in that sense, again, I think all three of us overlap here. But I'm just, I'm just want to be clear about what we mean by denial of death. See, when I think about denial of death, I think of uh, immaturity, innocence, uh, sentimentality, Disney World, Disneyland. Uh, ways in which people are trying to get so much distance from pain and hurt that they create fantasy. Now, I believe that has a role too. Fantasy has a role. That's, that's the fundamental with art. But it also has to sooner or later acknowledge its clay feet. That the very persons who generate the fantasy are themselves organisms tied to the earth with a history, with a family, with those flaws that you that you talk about. Yes, but there is this question that no no degree of allegory, no amount of metaphor, no splitting of the difference can avoid. We have this experience of indefinite fecundity. Yes. yes. Of, of our ability to go beyond the context, the circumstance. This this quality of surfeit, of spontaneity, of surprise, right. what Santayana described in the event. Then comes nature and decrees our death anyway. Uh, and so that there is, a, there is this brutal contrast between our experience of indefinite fecundity and the finality of death. And then, so there's this question of whether we have reason to believe that we won't really die. Uh, now, this is, this is a, a, a vital question. Oh, it that, 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 it divides, that it divides us in a certain way doesn't make it in, impossible for the believer and the unbeliever to have very similar positions, right, right. both on the political side and on the moral side. But what seems to me to be uh, very likely to be the case is that they will be much closer to each other yeah. if they are courageous uh, in rejecting uh, the easy splitting of the difference. Then either group will be to the sentimental half-believers who are simply dressing up the conventional moral and political pieties in this pseudo-theological language. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's the grand inquisitor. That is simply the manipulator of institutional religion who for the most part doesn't believe in it. But if you claim that... No, but I don't think it's fair to say doesn't believe. He half believes. The grand he believes as much as he believe can. No, no, I'm not talking about the grand inquisitor. I'm talking about us. Oh, 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the other side of this thing is this is this is I think where the Judaic and the Christian and Islam uh, claims have to be seriously wrestled with it. If you fundamentally believe that life itself is a precious and inimitable gift that you can never account for, it has its own sense of wonder and miracle, then at that point to live a life of foolishness in the world but not of it, which is something, again, we fundamentally agree with. And that the world is full of so much mystery, who are we to trump or foreclose any of subsequent miracles and wonders? We just don't know. We just don't know. And if some other authority comes along, physicists come along and say, we really know what reality is, you say, you don't say, uh-huh, you did 50 years ago and you changed your mind, didn't you? You're absolutely right, Brother West. You're just as fallible as I am. Keep doing your work. We appreciate it. <laughs> but in the end, the mystery and wonder and mere miraculous character of everyday people of Mago Day, all that was made in the likeness image of God, is such that you just don't know. You just intervene. You tell the truth. You fight. 
for justice. You love, you laugh, you break dance. You so, so for now, for now, you live. You know. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Christianity, if, I'm sorry, uh, Professor. If Christianity, as a tradition, insists on um, going out into the world yes. and making Christians of everyone, yes. that is not a claim of not knowing. That is a claim of knowing and actually yes. moving people to. And now this is where this is where I think I agree with you, Professor Anga, in that I find that the tradition of Christ, the inability for the tradition of Christianity to um, move for contemplative practices like traditions from the East yes, yes. touches on the idea of not wanting to um, even think about death. The idea that uh, I don't have to die because Christ has died for me. And, my, and therefore, my, my death at that point is not mine. It belongs to the body. And, and I think that's where the uh, traditions from the East have something to teach us because yes, then they yes. say, no, you sin, think about your death and how you might even want to die and how, how resurrecting your, the Buddha within you, and I might be speaking that bad, but resurrecting the Buddha within you is about self, um, self-initiating and, um, and uh, taking responsibility of oneself, of oneself side by side, the dogma, which I feel on, 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 on the Christian side, coming from Africa, and, and thinking of what uh, Du Bois said, that, that uh, Africa made Christianity the religion of the world. However, um, the, the extortion that followed that has nothing to do with the love and the making of, of Christians all over the world. Well, or, or that yeah. brotherly love, or the communion, or, or, the, or, being, or belonging to a God. Yeah, so, so, we, could, we could go on forever. Look at this. It has been folly, it will always be folly to try and discuss these problems in the form of a course. My, uh, one of our favorite poets, Jimmy Blake, yes. wrote. If the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you.